how good it is to be Lifehouse Church. Best church in Melbourne by far. Much better. Uh, and uh, no, we're really, what a, what a great, great community of people. I might join this church. What do you think? Uh, I'm coming. Uh, <laughs> well, we can start the Sydney campus. Richard. Oh, stop. <laughs> we can start stop the Sydney it. campus of Lifehouse Church. Stop. Yeah. All right, anyway, Bobby. I'm just going to say a quick hi. And um, I know Brian's got a word in his heart that is for the season. And I, I just encourage you to open your heart to it and allow it to become personal to you. But I also want to say thank you to Richard and Helen and to this family for the warm embrace. And, you know, the language of welcome home is very dear to my heart. And we have felt very much welcomed home here. And you guys have been, um, I'm just bragging on your pastors for a moment. You guys have been in our greater family for many years, like you just said. But it's really nice to get close range and share fellowship with you a couple of weeks back in Adelaide and then here this weekend. So we're indebted. And you've got good people here. They're fun. And just walking into this beautiful spiritual home and feeling that, it's felt. And that's testimony to our Lord Jesus Christ, of course, to these guys who are leading you and to you because we're family. And over the, just over the first, I don't know, last X amount of months, um, we have had the honor of going to a few churches. And I say the same thing, you know, wherever you go in the world, the one thing that is common where the name of Jesus is over the door is that you find family. And it's kind of same, same, different. But that's the nature of God and that's the nature of family. Same, same, different, because we're all unique and beautiful. So thanks for welcoming us. And uh, we, we, yeah, we just might come to Melbourne. <laughs> anyway, be blessed. Give him a hand. He's a Fantastic. good guy. <laughs> Fantastic. Nice Christmas tree there. Great band of musicians here. I like the big guy leading the worship. He was cool. He got a good voice. And uh, it is just really lovely being here. So Father, we're just so grateful for the presence of God. Lord, there's nothing like your presence. Father, I thank you for Pastor Richard, Helen, and for this incredible congregation. And Father, I thank you that every person here, every visitor, every regular, every person here is important to you. You've got a purpose and you've got a plan for every single life. And we say, have your way in our lives, Father. Have your way in this church. And may it continue to prosper and flourish and grow into all you've called it to be. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Let your word speak life to people today. And a faithful people said together, Amen. 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 All right, you guys can be seated. Fantastic. You guys can be seated. You can have smoko. <laughs> Make sure you're back by the end of the service. <laughs> ah, we had a banquet last night here in Melbourne. Your pastors took us out. I'm still bloated from a... I'm not really actually this heavy. It's just bloated from dinner last night. <laughs> Sorry. An anointing that will carry you. So the last two or three months, Bobby and I spent a couple of months in America recently, and while we were there, I preached in the last six weeks there in eight different cities in the USA. And I felt not just to preach messages I already had, messages I know, but to keep the discipline of creating new messages, you know, hearing from God. And so I did a series of messages. The first one was a legacy that will outlast you. The second one was a destiny that will consume you. The third one was a purpose that will propel you, which I might do tonight. And the fourth one is an anointing that will carry you. So in May the 6th, 2023, King Charles III will, of course, have his coronation and officially be crowned king. But he won't just be crowned. In actual fact, he will be consecrated, blessed, and anointed to be king. He's not just crowned, but he's anointed to be king. European monarchs have been doing that for centuries. In England, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of the Church of England, who, by the way, I know in the spirit of name dropping, I interviewed him once at Hillsong Conference in London. 
Uh, he will anoint King Charles King. But you know, an anointing is not just a ceremonial service for a European monarch or a British monarch. In actual fact, the anointing, an actual word for the anointing, an old-fashioned word is the unction, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And the anointing of the Holy Spirit is available for everybody. Not just preachers, everybody. No matter who you are, no matter what you do, no matter what your life. I was driven here by a man who transports animals around the world. I asked him, what's the most unusual animal that you've ever transported? And he said, a rhinoceros. I'm thinking, I hope that's a strong cage. A rhinoceros. Well, I believe he's anointed for that business. I believe you're anointed for what God's called you to do. I love the Holy Spirit. I love the idea of being anointed by the Holy Spirit. It's a visitation. It's an impartation to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. When I first ever started preaching, over 50 years ago, I wanted so much to serve God. And my father was, in that time was a prominent preacher and so on. And I don't know, I just felt the pressure. So when I preached, I'd get so nervous. I would start to blink. I was, I was the blinking preacher. I just blinked out of nerves. But of course, what it was needed to be able to rest is the anointing. When we first started Hillsong Church, 1983, we started in a little school hall. And for the first six months, we only had Sunday night services. And when I was in my parents' church, I was like an associate pastor. And I'd always preach if my father was away on a Sunday night service. And it was Sunday night services like faith and evangelism, getting people saved. I'd never really had to ever speak in a morning service that's more about building lives and growing people and teaching the Word of God. But as the time went on, so when we started, by the way, morning services, that, that was something that I, I felt that all at sea with. But as time went on, I feel like God anointed me to impart into people and grow people's lives. And the anointing. I was talking to Joyce Meyer. And I thought I asked her a really, really intelligent question. I said, Joyce, do you ever get nervous when you preach? And she looked at me like it was the most stupid question she's ever heard in her life. And she went, no, I don't even think about myself when I preach. I just try and help people. I just try and help people. What gives her that kind of rest? It's the anointing. Luke chapter 4, Jesus quotes Isaiah 61. And he says in verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because he has anointed me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. If Jesus needed the anointing when he lived and walked on earth, how much more do you and I need the anointing of the Holy Spirit? So Jesus has said he was anointed. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, he's Messiah. Messiah means the anointed one. In the New Testament, he is Jesus Christ. It's not his surname. His brother James wasn't James Christ. No, Christ, the anointed one. Jesus, Jesus is the anointed one. And can I tell you, when the anointing of the Holy Spirit is on your life, it's not as though nothing changes. The truth is, everything changes with the anointing of the Holy Spirit on your life. So in the Old Testament, Jacob was anointed to be a high priest. And then firstly, Saul was anointed by Samuel to be king. And then David, of course, was anointed to be king. <laughs> and it's not as though nothing changed. Listen to what the Bible says about Saul when he was anointed to be king. It's 1 Samuel chapter 10. And I'll read a few different verses. It says, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it over Saul's head. I've got a huge 
four gallon drum of oil back there for the end of the service. We're going to be pouring it over everybody's head. We're going to start with you, Richard. We're going to start with you. There you are. Yeah. Yeah. May we make that head shine even more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm going to read it here because it's hard for me to read here. Then Samuel took a flask of oil, poured it over Saul's head. He kissed Saul and said, I am doing this because the Lord has appointed you to be the ruler over Israel, his special possession. Now look at what happens as we keep going to verse six. At that time, the spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you. When, when he's anointed, the spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you and you will prophesy with them. Listen, you will be changed. You will be changed into a different person. That's the anointing. The same person, and yet there's a difference now. As Saul turned and started to leave, God gave him a new heart. See, it's not as though nothing changes. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He became a different man. God gave him a new heart, and all Samuel's signs were fulfilled that day. Listen to it. When Saul and his servant arrived at Gibeah, they saw a group of prophets coming toward them. Then the Spirit of God came powerfully upon Saul. That's what I'm believing. The Spirit of God to come powerfully upon us. <laughs> and he too began to prophesy. Well, that just wasn't done. So when those who knew Saul heard about it, they exclaimed, what? Is even Saul a prophet? How did the son of Kish? They're being derisive. They're being cynical. How did the son of Kish become a prophet? They ask, and one of those standing there said, can anyone become a prophet now? No matter who his father is. Because to be a prophet was an exclusive club. Prophets and sons of prophets. You don't just suddenly decide you're going to become a prophet. No matter who his father is. So that is the origin of the saying, is even Saul a prophet? So he became a different person. God changed his heart. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him. When the Spirit of God comes upon you, you might be good at making money if you're a business person. But I'll tell you, when you're anointed to make money with a kingdom spirit, that's a different thing altogether. Amen. That's a different thing altogether. And so we all need the anointing on our lives. Some people, we need anointing for parenthood. People are anointed for empathy and compassion. Some people are anointed for hospitality for leadership, for whatever it is God's called you to in life. But let's never be content to live our lives without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit anointing you. What happens? Well, number one, hard things become easy. The anointing makes hard things become easy. Saul was the son of Kish. Kish, his father, his name meant difficult or hard. That's literally what Saul came from difficulty and hardship. His father was a herdsman. He was a farmer. He was no prophet. And so all of a sudden, this guy who comes from difficulty and hardship is anointed to be a king. And not only that, as a different man now, he's prophesying among the prophets. It all changed. The hardship became easy. That's what the Spirit of God does. What is it in your life that's hard? It's hard growing that business. It's, it's, it's hard building a church. It's, 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 it's hard sometimes to commit to a healthy marriage. It can be hard. But God makes hard things easy. The anointing can take whatever is hard in your life and bring an ease to it. And I love that thought, you see. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. It says literally that the yoke will be destroyed by the anointing oil, or the anointing breaks the yoke. Well, a yoke represents oppression and bondage and hardship, but the anointing breaks the yoke. So whatever is hard in your life right now, what is it? It's just hard. It's hard ground. It's hard work. I mean, God can take hard hearts, and through the anointing, hard hearts become soft. Because hard things become easy. When we started Hillsong all those years ago, 1983, 
there was a lady who with her husband came to church and she's a lovely lady. It would be wrong to call her hard-hearted because she has a lovely heart, but she was hard when it came to the things of the Spirit. She was really hard when it came to the idea of the Holy Spirit being evident in our lives. I'll never forget it because in those early days, she'd sit there in church look, looking like a prune. And uh, one time she came up on, a, on an older call and I was young, I was 29 when we started and I laid my hands on her and the Holy Spirit touched her. And she went Doom, down under the power of God and suddenly her hard heart became soft. I wonder what it is in your life that's hard, that God can turn soft or what's hard. And God can make easy, whether it's hard heart or a hard atmosphere. <laughs> Sometimes you can walk into a room and there's just a hard atmosphere. I've preached in churches where it's just a hard atmosphere. This is not one of those churches. This church is incredible. Yeah. yeah. This is the church where the back row is even more excited than the front row. It never happens. It never happens. But look at the back there. They're hanging off the ceiling back there. It's amazing. <laughs> but you know what? I, well, as a young preacher, I used to preach at youth camps. I was the Youth Alive guy, and I'd preach at youth camps. And one time I was preaching at a youth camp in New South Wales in a place called Newcastle. You know it. <laughs> and, uh, oh, my gosh, these young people, they were off the planet. I'm trying to preach, and they're laughing and throwing things and talking to each other. And my natural man wanted to get down and start punching kids. I just wanted to <laughs> smash them. But I felt like the anointing of the Holy Spirit came upon me and suddenly started bringing words of knowledge and prophesying over young people. And uh, it's amazing, the whole atmosphere changed and suddenly a hard atmosphere became easy. Well, all of us have in our lives situations which are hard. It might, it might be literally a hard business negotiation. But God can give you a word of wisdom. He can give you a word of knowledge. He can, he can make hard ground easy. So whether it's hard heart, hard atmosphere, hard ground, what is in your life right now? Just hard ground. Well, let's never forget it. God makes hard things easy. Through the anointing. Through the anointing. And the second thing is, the anointing brings the Holy Spirit into the fore. The anointing brings the Holy Spirit into an action. If I can talk again about when we first planted what became Hillsong Church. No one was getting saved. No one would. In our Sunday night services, I'd be believing and no one was getting saved. No one was giving their life to Jesus. So I started fasting on Sundays. I could do with doing that again now, actually. But <laughs> So I just fast Sundays and just believe God for an anointing for salvation in the house. Well, it's a long story and I won't tell it, but we had this breakthrough where 33 people in a tiny church gave their lives to Jesus in three weeks. But the point is, that anointing has never left the house. Over the years, has been, I would dare to say globally, millions of people make decisions for Christ. And that's what God can do through His anointing. He breaks the yoke. He makes hard things easy. He brings the Holy Spirit to force. So what happened, of course, when Saul was anointed, what happened? The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. When David was anointed, the Bible says, with olive oil, from that day, the Scripture says, the Spirit of the Lord was with him from that day forward. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me. That's what the Holy Spirit does through His anointing. The whole anointing comes up upon you, it's in you, and all of a sudden the Spirit of God becomes real in your life. So it brings all of the things in the realm of the Spirit to the fore. Things like the gifts of the Spirit. I already mentioned words of wisdom, word of knowledge. Imagine you are really in a difficult situation, and you don't know what to do. There's no natural answer. And you pray and believe for God's anointing, and a word of wisdom comes in that situation. And suddenly, it's not even yourself. There are words coming directly from the Holy Spirit. Well, that's what the anointing can do. Did I mention a hard business negotiation? And all of a sudden, through the anointing, the Holy Spirit comes to the fore. He gives you that word of wisdom. 
suddenly hard things become easy. I love the Holy Spirit. I love the, anoint, the idea of God's anointing. Brings the gifts of the Spirit to the fore. The anointing brings the presence of the Holy Spirit to the fore. You don't want to just walk into church and sing happy songs and then say it's songs and then... No, no, we want to sense the presence of God in the house. There's nothing like the presence of God. The presence of God has no counterfeit. There is nothing like the presence of God. One of the songs we were singing this morning, what was it? Move on me or open the... Uh, I will make room for you. That's the one. I love the lyrics so much I can't remember them, but... <laughs> But your pastor turned and said, I love this song. I love this song. Why are we singing? You know, Holy Spirit, make, make room. Make room. And uh, that's what the Holy Spirit does. The presence of God. Some of you would know Pastor Joseph Prince from Singapore. And he's known as a grace preacher. You know, his message is grace. But to be honest with you, my experience, what Joseph Prince mainly preaches is Jesus. He just preaches Jesus, 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 who, of course, is grace personified. And often when he finishes teaching, and it can take a long time, often when he's finished teaching, you get people up and start worshiping. And you literally sense the presence of God. Ah, the presence of God in your life. Presence of God in not only your heart and in your life, but, you know, in your environment, in your home. You know, the presence of God. Well, I believe through the anointing, you can know the presence of God in an evident and a tangible way. So whether it's the gifts of the Spirit or the presence of the Holy Spirit or whether it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, we all need the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe the anointing is bold, it's confident, it's fearless. It brings the power of the Holy Spirit. In Luke 8, Jesus came across that man who was demonized Naked, they put chains on him, he'd break the chains. He was haunting people, frothing at the mouth, just completely under what the Bible says, he was completely under the devil's power until Jesus, the anointed one, starts walking toward him. And suddenly, the power of God, the power of the Spirit completely changed the power that controlled that man's life. How awesome is that? We need the power of God in our life and you can know the power of God in your life in a practical and a tangible way. And so, yes, number three, the anointing will be opposed. I've never ever in my life had any opposition. Never been persecuted. Never been disrupted. Well, not since... Last week anyway. But you know what? The devil is threatened by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And don't ever be surprised if you've got God's anointing on your life or on your home or on your business or your profession, whatever. Don't ever be surprised if it brings opposition. The devil will oppose. He'll persecute. He will disrupt. But I'll tell you this. He cannot stop the flow of the anointing in your life. He cannot stop it. But the anointing, the idea of you living anointed because it supercharges your life, it's a threat to the devil. When it comes to God's anointing, I can squander it. Saul, the first king of Israel, he squandered the anointing. I can squander it. God can lift it, but the devil can't steal it. He'll try to oppose. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the gospel to heal broken hearts, to set captives free, to open blind eyes, to bring freedom to the oppressed, to preach a message of favor. I'm telling you, Jesus was the yoke-breaking, devil-shaking, ground-taking, kingdom-making, never-forsaking. <laughs> King of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, the anointed one. Jesus, the anointed one. Whereas the devil, he's just a mud-raking, power-faking, credit-taking, confidence-shaking, defeated foe. <laughs> and so even when the opposition comes, don't forget, Jesus breaks the yoke. Let's never forget. And you know what the Bible says? It says in Psalm something or other. I reckon it's 
Psalm 45, 15. Because I know the Bible off by heart. <laughs> but this is what it says. Do not touch. Do not touch my anointed one. <laughs> and do my prophets no harm. Do not touch my anointed one. When you're anointed, it never ends well for those who touch God's anointed one. It's not going to end well for them. And so even though the anointing may be opposed in your life, there's a promise from God. He'll protect His anointed. He puts a warning out there, do not touch my anointed one. Maybe you are facing opposition or persecution and you're being opposed and it's because of the blessing of God on your life. It's because of His anointing on your business or it's because, well, I've got to tell you right now, it never ends well for those who touch God's anointed. Amen. And so here's the fourth thing. The fourth thing about the anointing. Is this okay? Yeah. Yeah. The fourth thing about the anointing is it has inherent dangers. What do I mean by that? It means it makes you look better than you really are. His anointing makes you look better than you really are. Saul became a different man. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him. God changed his heart, gave him a new heart. He's suddenly prophesying. This guy's out looking for his father's donkeys. He's from hardship. He's from difficulty. Now all of a sudden, he's prophesying amongst the prophets and he's anointed to be king. The anointing will always make you look better than you are. We started a little church in Borkham Hills. I mean, what kind of name is that for a suburb? Bork, Borkham Hills. Yeah, in a little tiny school hall. And Bobby and I are not capable of building a church that ends up having a global impact. It has an attendance in Australia, actual bums on seats, on the weekend of 47,000 people. And around the world, 150,000 people. We can't do that. Global impact through the worship, global impact through the television ministry and leadership and who knows what else. Well, you know what? That's the Holy Spirit. He makes you look better than you are. We started a church over a decade ago in New York. No one knew who those pastors were then. Joel was involved, my son, and he's a well-known worship leader and songwriter, so to that degree, but 3,000 people turned up first week. Same thing happened in South Africa. Something like 2,700 people first week. None of them knew who the pastors were. <laughs> Similar thing in Los Angeles. And it would be easy for people to think, well, this is because of us. It wasn't because of them. No one even knew them. And in your life, it's so easy to start thinking, man, I'm pretty good. But that's the anointing. It just makes you look. I mean, moving rhinoceroses around the world, to think you're anointed for that, <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> but I've heard a little bit of the story of how God's blessing this guy. That's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It just, we've always said, what I'm part of is bigger than the part I play. The moment I think this is because of me, like Saul, he's now a prophet, he's now a king. Well, what is in your life where the anointing makes you better than, you know, you know this is better than you are. But that's the danger of the anointing. Are we, are we good? Yeah. That's the danger of the anointing. Well, no problem. All we have to do is remember who this is about, what this is about, and realize God is equipping us, making us look better than we are for His glory, for His kingdom. Some of us could do with the Lord making us look better than we really are. Let's be honest, because we are failed human beings. We are, we are frail. We, we, we're flawed. But the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit on your life can make you 10 foot tall. That's why I love the Holy Spirit. That's why I love the idea of His anointing. Because the anointing not only breaks the yoke, but the anointing, it supercharges your life. And number five, number five, the anointing is for service, not power. Yeah, we can think, well, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. We can easily think, look at me. 
but it's not about you. Abraham, God gave him a vision. He said, look at the stars. And he looks at the stars, and they're numerous there. And he gets a word. I will give you descendants like the stars of the sky. God gives him a vision that's in the sky. But his feet are in the wilderness, in the desert. His feet are in the dust. And the vision God gave him in the sky was outworked by his feet in the dust. And that's the whole thing. The anointing, it may give you a vision in the stars, may give you even opportunity in the stars, but where it's worked out is not through power, it's service. Service. Listen to this. <laughs> Jesus was in the house of a guy called Simon. And in that house, Mary anointed his feet with oil. And Jesus said, in Luke 7, verse 46, Jesus said to Simon, you have not anointed my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Kings are anointed on their head. Jesus was never anointed on his head. I think there may actually be one gospel that says she anointed his head and his feet, but she anointed his feet. Your feet are for service. So Jesus, servant king, was anointed for service, even though he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And if we realize why the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes on our lives, it's about being a blessing. It's about impact. It's about serving God. It's about extending the kingdom. It's about seeing the word of the Lord go forth in Jesus' name. So let's always keep his anointing about serving and not power. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe one more. The anointing number six. It takes the gifts God puts on your life, the gifts and the talents he's graced you with, and I said it a couple of times, supercharges them. In other words, I said, makes you look better than you are. We've all got gifts. We've all got talents. We've all got things we're graced to do. But with the anointing, that gets supercharged. I would, Bobby and I were on the east coast of America last year, and we're actually on a boat, and a Cape Canaveral, like a rocket, went shooting up into the sky, and there was a fireball behind it. And I noticed on TV this week a brand new generation of space rockets, I think called Artemis, Artemis One, and the fireball behind that, as the first one was launched, and the goal ultimately is to take men to the Mars, initially. Take man back to the moon, but then take humanity to Mars. Well, can I tell you, without that fiber, if that wasn't jet propelled, that thing would hardly get off the ground, yeah. let alone shoot into the stratosphere and head toward the moon or head toward Mars. It wouldn't have a chance. So think of that. Think of that jet propulsion because that's what the anointing does with your gift, your talent. Maybe you're graced, you're, you're gifted in a sphere like medicine or technology or any other sphere you can think of in business or in anything. But with the anointing, that's supercharged. Anyone here ever been in a Tesla? Bobby and I were in Germany earlier this year and we've been driven in a Tesla. And I mean, that thing's freaky. It's so fast. It's like a rocket. Elon Musk, he puts rockets in the sky and he invented cars that are rockets. They fly. Now you look under the bonnet, the hood, there's nothing there. <laughs> you open the boot, the trunk, there's nothing there. All you can hear is the whir of the tires on the road. There's no noise, there's no revving, there's no engine. How could that happen? How could that happen? Because under your feet, somewhere in the chassis or under the floor, there's a whole big range of batteries back there. But you can't see them. But they're propelling that car. And sometimes we can't see what's propelling our lives, but we know it. And uh, God can jet propel your life. In 2 Corinthians, Paul, he's talking to what were called super apostles. They were like, you know, self-righteous super apostles, they called them. 
And uh, they compared themselves, classed themselves, measured themselves. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12, we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but them comparing themselves amongst themselves and measuring themselves by themselves are not wise. Then listen, this is what he says. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the sphere that God appointed us. The sphere that God appointed us. And he's telling the Corinthians that that's a sphere that especially includes you. Well, you know, it's in that sphere. I like to call it your grace zone. That's where the anointing will be on your life. If God anointed you to be a business person and you're graced to be a business person and through the anointing, he supercharges that opportunity to be in business, but you decide you want to be a preacher, well, sometimes people are square pegs in right holes. They're, 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 because the anointing will always be in what God graced you to do. Who he graced you to be, what he graced you to do. Don't feel like that's a limitation. It just means that God will take your gift, your talent, your grace, and supercharge it. And remember, the anointing, Jesus, through the anointing, preached the gospel to the poor. The best good news for the poor is an answer to their poverty. And through the anointing, different ministries that maybe you work with, people we've worked with over the years, and they're anointed. They are anointed to bring the reality, the gospel, into the lives of the poor. But you know, maybe you're not poor materially. For so many people, their thinking is impoverished. Maybe they're, they're emotionally impoverished. And through the anointing of perhaps on the inside, there's a, a poverty of soul. It might affect the way you think. Negativity rules you. You're kind of controlled with negative emotions. And Well, here's the thing, the anointing. Jesus, through the anointing, his gospel was good news to the poor. So areas where maybe you're impoverished, his anointing is good news to you because he'll bring bounty to that area of poverty. You struggle with negativity. You struggle with impoverished thoughts. You struggle sometimes with impoverished feelings about yourself. You're emotionally bankrupt. Well, the Spirit of God, the anointing, it can bring beauty to that area of poverty. Or Jesus was anointed to heal broken hearts. There may be people here, literally your heart has been broken. Or other people, there's just brokenness in your life. One of the impacts of COVID is just, it's just, ex, 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 what's the word? Sounds like, uh, <laughs> extenuates. Is that a word? Extenuates. Increases. I think extenuates is a word. Is it a word? Yeah? See, I'm right. Yeah, this is an educated lady over here. Yeah. And so, this is the pastor's side, that's the educated side. <laughs> so anyway, let me tell you what I was going to say. Yeah, basically, the anointing, the anointing, sometimes it has, it's increased people's sense of brokenness. And brokenness is very real. And it can come in so many different ways. But if there's areas of brokenness in your life, it's through the anointing that Jesus heals broken things. Beautiful, through his anointing. It's through his anointing that captives are set free. We all know bondages can affect our lives. And that bondage might, again, be related to the way you think. You just can't see yourself the way God sees you. It may be a myriad of things from addictions and all the various in bondages that people have, but through the anointing. Jesus sets the captive free. The anointing, through the anointing, Jesus opened blind eyes. I love that thought. Jesus opened blind eyes through the anointing. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him. He was anointed to open blind eyes. What is it that God sees for your life that you just can't see? As a young preacher, our church was, it was a growing church. It was a good suburban church. 
And I was walking down the street, George Street, in the middle of Sydney, with a pastor friend from South Africa called Ray McCauley. He had a huge church. They had a huge conference. Their conference, I'd never seen anything like it. Like 10,000 people would come, and the atmosphere and the, the whole thing. It was so inspiring for Bobby and I. So I'm walking down George Street with Ray McCauley, and he stops. And he looks at me, and he says, you'll have 10,000 people in this city. Brian, you just wait and see. Well, you know what? I wanted to see it, but I couldn't see it. What is it that God sees in your life you just can't see? But the Spirit of God, the anointing, opens blind eyes. You begin to see what God sees. Like Elisha's um, servant, who his eyes were blinded to the power of God, and all he could see was the size of the enemy. And the prophet said, open his eyes that he may see. And he started to suddenly see the armies of the Lord. He suddenly started to see the presence and the power of God that was with him. Greater is he that's with us than he is working against us. Amen. So what area in your life can God open? Blind eyes through the anointing. But the oppressed were set free. Through the anointing, Jesus had a message of favor, grace, favor, blessing, promise, help in time of need, the anointing. Let's never ever un uh, underestimate the beauty of the anointing in our, in our lives, in this church. I walked in and I sensed, you can, you can sense a unified church. It's, it's not just something you witness, it's something you sense. And you know, blessing is where there's unity. And I believe for an anointing of unity to be upon this church in Jesus' name. Amen. Have we got the musos here? Come on, guys. Where's the big guy? Come on. Fantastic. Here he comes. Here he comes. Uh, uh. A lumberjack by day, a worship leader by night. Uh, come on. Can we sing that We Need a Fresh Wind? Can we all stand together, everybody? We're going to sing this and enjoy it together. Don't worry, I'll do your job for you. <laughs> uh. <laughs> there you go. That's my exercise for the week. <laughs> Can we sing this though? Listen, seriously. Jesus, I think it's interesting, he's never anointed on his head, he's anointed for his feet. In other words, there's something powerful about anointing service when we literally anoint people with oil. There's an impartation there. It's beautiful, it's powerful. But you don't have to have an anointing with oil to know His anointing. I'm going to believe right now in this moment, in this service, as we come toward an end, I'm going to believe for His anointing, the Holy Spirit's anointing, to come upon people's lives. If God can do that for Jacob, for Saul, for David, if Jesus Himself, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Him, I'm going to take a moment now and believe as we sing for the Spirit of the Lord to come upon us. I want to encourage you to reach out. Have a sense of pulling that anointing down. And believe wherever it is you need God's anointing on your life, in your grace zone, in your field of service, in your home, in your family, whatever it is, we're going to believe for the anointing to start touching people's lives. Come on. Because we need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Come on, all the way to the back. Let's Pour sing this together. Spirit out. Pour your spirit out. Here it is, a holy, a holy anointing. anointing. An anointing, Father. The power of your presence. The anointing, Lord Jesus. Pour your spirit out. Pour your spirit out. Yes. Because we need a fresh wind. The fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out. Come on, come on. Pour your spirit Let's believe for the Holy Spirit to be poured out in this place. A holy anointing, the power of your presence. Pour your spirit out. 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 Pour your 
fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven, pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out, the holy anointing, the power of your presence, pour your spirit out. moment here, stay in the presence of God. Just draw on the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We believe God pours the Spirit out freely and openly and willingly. I believe for an increase in the presence of God in your life through His anointing. An increase of the power of God in your life through His anointing. An increase of the gifts of the Spirit in your life through His anointing. Lord, anoint people for the task ahead of them. Anoint them for the challenge that before them. Anoint them, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Just one more thing. As I hand back to Pastor Richard, very, very quickly, let me ask you a question. Is there, have you, you personally, have you ever made a conscious choice to surrender ownership of your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? An actual decision where you know that you know that something changed. Have you ever encountered God in a personal way? Have you ever made that decision? The Bible says if you ask Jesus to come into your life, He will. It's a promise. He will. And He'll live in you. He'll dwell in you. He'll reside in you. What an incredible advantage it is in life when you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And He's in you. He dwells in you. Have you ever made that choice? I'm going to give people the opportunity right now. In a moment, I'm going to ask everyone to close your eyes and I'm going to count to three. And on three, I'm going to ask every single person everywhere who says, Brian, when you pray for people to make a choice for Jesus, will you include me? I would love to include you. So on three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm going to believe there's going to be a lot of you. It's not just going to be one person, all right? So you're not going to be on your own. Maybe you, at some point, you made a decision for Jesus. But somewhere along the way, you lost your way. And it's not as though God moved. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But we can make a choice, you know. We can make choices and have us living dislocated or alienated from the center of the will of God, that anointed place. What a perfect day to pray a prayer saying, Jesus, I don't want to be backslidden. I don't want to be not right with you. I want to come back to living within your anointing. I'm going to believe to come back to Jesus at the center of my life. So are you ready for that? If you say, Brian, when you pray for me, for people to be saved, to be born again, to make that conscious choice for Jesus, will you include me? Then on three, you raise your hand. If you say, Brian, when you pray for people to make their peace with God, for, to turn from their backsliding, to get right with Him and come back to Jesus in the center and living within the realm of His Spirit, is anointed. Brian, will you include me in that prayer? On three, you raise your hand. And then I'm going to pray a prayer with everybody who raises your hand. And today, Jesus is going to change lives. So we have every eye closed, every person in prayer. And remember, if you say, Brian, include me in that prayer, then on three, you raise your hand. I believe there'll be a whole lot of hands and then I'll lead you in a prayer and hand back to Pastor Richard. So here we go. Are you ready? If you say, Brian, include me in that prayer, on three, you raise your hand, and then we'll pray. One, two, three. Lift them up. Fantastic. Look at all these hands. How wonderful. There's an anointing for salvation in this household, in Jesus' name. Anyone else want to join them? There's a whole lot of hands raised. Anyone else? You quickly lift your hand as well. Can we give these people a great big congratulations? And Come on, a big congratulations. When one claps, we all clap. <laughs> so we're going to pray this prayer out loud. I'll pray that you guys pray boldly after me. And today is a life-changing day. If you raise your hands, you pray this to God. But we'll all pray along with you because we're family here. So pray these words. Dear Jesus, this is the moment I surrender ownership of my life. Nice and bold. Come on. I surrender ownership of my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of you, Jesus, from this moment, my sins are forgiven. I'm a child of God. 
a new creation. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.